and amen. Good morning, Moody Church. I am so greatly encouraged when I think about that people are worshiping with us now from everywhere, from the Philippines to Memphis to Mississippi, Chicago, the west side, the east side. This morning, we have the awesome privilege of opening our Bibles and hearing from the one and true and living God. And beloved, the miracle of the Bible is that it is always true. It's always relevant. It transcends time and space. It knows no limitations of geographical boundaries or borders. God's word applies to everyone, to every race, to every tribe, to every culture, and to every age. Its teachings are timeless. And God, in his sovereignty, would have us peruse the passage known as chapter 5 of the book of James today. O oh, beloved, do you see God at work here? James, as we've learned as we've been walking through this book, is full of practical applications. He is instructing and teaching and guiding and telling us how we should live, how we should talk, and how we should respond in times of trouble. Times of trouble. What an important and relevant message for today. In the time of trouble we are witnessing in our world, in our country, in our city, and in our church. Do we have a word from heaven? I'd invite you, if you would, please, to turn in your Bibles now to James chapter 5. How interesting it is that in this passage that's devoted to providing instructions to God's people in times of trouble, James launches into this no-holes-barred condemnation of rich people. Now, to be clear, James is not condemning wealth. Scripture is full of many faithful people to God who had money. He isn't condemning wealth per se, but rather the sinful use of wealth. He here is teaching us that the pursuit of wealth that fails to take into account the reality of God, God's sovereignty, and God's will for humanity is wrong. It's sin. Their sin is not just that they're living like there is no tomorrow. Their sin is that they're living like there is no God. And while this particular passage is addressed to rich non-believers, its teachings apply to those of the household of faith as well. These are non-believers. He's going to talk to believers a little bit, and we're going to talk about that. But he's talking to non-believers here because there's no exhortation for them to return to God in this passage. Let's look at the text. I'm at... James chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the misery that is coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corrupted, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you've kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Look at the indictment that James is leveling against rich people in times of trouble. He lists several sins here, and the first one is hoarding. Do you see that in verses 1 through 3? Storing up things 
not to do good, but just having things, storing them up. They have so much stuff, in fact, that it's rotten and it's moth-eaten. Now, if we're going to be honest, we live in a culture and in a country where the accumulation of stuff and money is admired. I told you at the onset that James is full of practical application, and so here's one right from the starting gate. If we ask ourselves, when do we have too much? How many cars? How many watches? How many shoes and purses? I know, oh, you said, hold on, Pastor. I was with you right up to that point, but you're talking about shoes and purses. You better leave that alone because you can never have too many shoes and purses. I'm wondering, though, beloved, if we were to empty out our homes, our attics and our garages and basements, and we just got rid of the things that we weren't using anymore, the things that we don't need, do you think we'd have enough to open a resale shop? Do you think there'd be enough to maybe provide some employment for people in a neighborhood that needs jobs? Do you think we'd be able to provide high quality things to people at very affordable prices just with the abundance of things that we have in our closets, in our garages? in our basements, something to ponder. He levels this indictment against the rich and says, you're hoarders, you just hoard things. The second thing he says is, you steal. Look at verse four. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud. These wages are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the Lord of hosts. There's an old saying, if you lie, you'll cheat, and if you'll cheat, you'll steal, and if you'll steal, you'll kill. There's a lot of biblical support for this. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, It says, you shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in the land within the town. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun goes down. What they were saying here in that passage is that these were day laborers. They were dependent upon their wages at the end of each day. And when those wages were withheld, that would be the difference between somebody eating or not, between somebody living or not. This was very serious business. To cheat someone out of their wages, this was, in fact, a matter of life and death. He calls them out for their extravagant living. Now, beloved, God wants you and I to enjoy the blessings of this life, but not being wasteful and not robbing people, fattening ourselves up, as the passage tells us, like cattle going to the slaughter. Hmm. And then he talks about injustice. Rich people are hoarding, rich people are robbing, rich people are stealing, Rich people are living extravagantly, but they're also taking advantage of the poor. They're abusing their privilege and their power to take advantage of people. Now, I have to ask myself, why would James take the time to lay out for us these sins of rich non-believers? We already know they're bad. Why is he telling us of the household of faith what non-believers are doing? I think there are two primary reasons why he takes the time to tell us. One is simply this, so we won't be tempted to envy them. So we won't be tempted to envy their lifestyle and what they have and what they do, and we won't covet it and want it because he's calling it out and saying that this is sin. 
The other reason, however, is to remind us that we worship a God who sees, a God who knows, a God who hears, and a God who ultimately will judge. In the passage, it refers to God as the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. Now, this is a battle term. Don't be confused. The God that we worship certainly doesn't need any help with anything. The God that we worship doesn't need an army, but he's got one. And the God that we worship doesn't need legions of angels to do anything, but he has them at his command. God is the avenger of wrongs. And James simply here wants to remind us that sin will be judged. God is the avenger and he will do it. That's the significance in this passage when he says, oh, you're going to weep and wail. That word wail there, that onomatopoeia is one of these words that in the, the word itself, it describes the action like oink or buzz or rustle. He's saying, you're going to wail, not in repentance, but because the judgment is going to come upon you. Rich people, judgment is coming and James is making it clear that the whales are the reality of the misery that is coming because we in fact worship a God who knows, a God who hears, a God who sees, and a God who is coming again. In fact, beloved, the second coming of Christ is arguably the main thought in this last chapter of James. And that brings me now then to the three instructions that James has for us as believers in times of trouble. I suggested to you earlier that James was rebuking and condemning non-believers when he launched into his indictment regarding rich people. He makes the transition now at verse 7, and he's talking to believers, to those of the household of faith. Look at the text, starting at verse 7. Be, what's that next word? Patient. Do you see it? Be patient, therefore, brothers. That's how we know he's talking to the household of faith until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient, there's that word again, until the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brother, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job and you've seen the prophets of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Patience mentioned several times here. Now, God doesn't stutter. If we're going to be truthful this morning, patience is definitely an area in our lives where we all could use some help. Can I get a witness? Oh, I'm the only person that needs help with patience? Haven't you ever wanted to look at somebody and say, listen, you're about to exceed the limitations of my medication? All of us have been impatient, and we've all exercised impatience when pressed by problems. However, the Bible here is teaching us that in times of trouble, we are to be patient. Now, patience is not being idle. A better word here translated would almost be endurance. In times of trouble, we are to have endurance. Well, how long am I supposed to be patient? The passage says, until the coming of the Lord. Well, why am I being patient? Why do I have to endure? Because the Lord is coming. In times of trouble, we're instructed to live our lives as though Jesus himself would instantly appear at our sides. 
when Christians sincerely, authentically look for the return of Jesus, the evidence of that hope shows up daily in their lives in good times and in times of trouble. As we're patient, enduring, the word says we fortify ourselves, strengthening our hearts to stand against sin, bearing the burdens, strengthening our hearts to fight the battles for the kingdom of God. No, beloved, patience is not idleness. And to help us understand this, James provides us with three illustrations and one strong admonition. So what does spirit-inspired patience look like? If you're going to exhibit the patience that James is talking about here, what would that look like? And he says, fine, let me give you an example. The first one, he says, consider the farmer. Now, I grew up in an urban environment. I've visited some farms, but that's not my life experience. I do understand, however, that farming is labor intensive. My father-in-law each year puts out a garden. It is beautiful, gorgeous. It's huge. It has an abundance of things. And after visiting with him several times, I thought, well, I'll do a garden. There was a lot of grunting and sweating and tilling and weeding. And I hadn't even gotten outside yet. Gardening, farming is hard, hard work. You got to prepare the soil. You got to plant the seeds. You got to till the ground. You can't plant seeds and expect that they're going to sprout up overnight. But note, the farmer's labor is also dependent on events that aren't under his control. Yeah, he can prepare the soil, he can plant the seeds, but he needs that early rain, that rain that comes in October and November. Then he has to wait for the late rain that comes in April and May. So when he's out there first breaking that ground, he's trusting that God's gonna provide the early rain. When he plants the seeds, he's trusting that God will be providing that late rain as well. That's why Galatians 6, 9 tells us, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Huh. In times of trouble, we don't get weary doing good, we don't give up, and we live expecting God to provide whatever it is that we need as we labor. Justice, mercy, grace, the second example that he provides for us in, in times of trouble, he says, I want you to consider the prophets. So if you want to know what spirit-inspired patience looks like, think about the farmer, but I want you to think about the prophets. Look at the text again. Verse 10, as an example of suffering and patience, there's that word again, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. Now it's interesting, James does not provide the names of the prophets he's considering. But if we give it some thought in the context of times of trouble, a few quickly come to mind. Elijah would be one. He was persecuted by old king compromise, Ahab and Jezebel. Certainly we would think about Jeremiah. He suffered not only from pagan kings, but also from his own people. And what was his crime? What did he do that was wrong? He was faithfully delivering the word that God had given him to deliver. Tradition tells us that Isaiah was cut in two. In times of trouble, if you're doing God's will, beloved, don't expect utopia. But more importantly, and here I think is his main point, the prophets spoke out even when it meant that they knew that they would suffer. In times of trouble, the people of God are not idle. They endure 
with patience. They live as though Jesus will show up at any second, and they never retreat from speaking the truth. They speak up. They speak out. When there is abuse, the people of God cry out. When there is cruelty, they speak out. When there is injustice, they speak out. We cannot talk about this passage today without acknowledging the plight in America. And I'm here to tell you plain that racism has no place in the household of faith. This is not my opinion, it's not my preference, it's not my politics, my tradition, my belief, but it is the word of God that says it has no place in the household of faith. Didn't God say in John 7, 24, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment? It's found in Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, but we were all in Christ Jesus. In Romans 10.12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on his name. In Acts, Peter had to cry out and say, truly, now I understand God shows no impartiality. And when John was on the Isle of Patmos, seeing the vision of that to come after he looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from every tribe, people and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes. Beloved, racism has no place in the body of Christ. Certainly we can disagree, but we do so without destruction. We can protest without trying to punish. We can rally, but not riot. And like the prophets of old, we speak the words of God in times of trouble and injustice. We cry out in times of injustice until justice rolls down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Patience, like a farmer, like the prophets, and then he throws us a curve like Job. Interesting that James would use the life of Job as an example of patience. In chapter 31 of Job, Job spends a lot of time demanding answers. What's going on? Why is this happening? Doesn't sound too patient to me. But I think the point James is making for us is just this simple. Patient endurance will sustain itself when rested on the conviction that times of trouble are not random and meaningless, but God has some purpose in them. Now this is hard theology, but we know this. There isn't anything that happens in our lives that does not have to go through God's permissive will. This is hard theology, and I have to confess to you that it's difficult for me to get my mind around all of it sometimes. God is atemporal. He looks at the past and the present and the future like you and I look at a photograph. And so the things that come up in our lives that catch us off guard by surprise, not only did God know they were going to happen, he allowed them and permitted them. Now, it's hard for me to understand that. But the truth is, if God knew about it, and he did, and he allowed it, and he has, and he permitted it, then he also has a plan. And we rest and we trust in that, that God is still in control. God is still sovereign. This world is not spinning out of control. There is a God, and he still loves his people. We have another final comment about patience and this admonition that he gives, and we need to give it some attention. In verse 9, he says, Do not grumble against one another's brothers, talking about people in the household of faith, 
so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Now, admittedly, times of trouble bring tension. And you've been impatient. Have you ever said something you've regretted? Have you ever been too quick to say something? As I was preparing this message, I was brought to my knees many times remembering how patient God had been with me. And apparently, in the times of suffering that these dear saints were experiencing, the Christians there were being critical and they were complainers. Here, James reminds us not to judge, not to criticize. The roots of criticism are always hypocrisy and jealousy, beloved, always. Murmuring, complaining is a serious sin among God's people. And James reminds us that God is the judge, not us, and that God hears and that God is standing at the door. Oh, my. He reminds us that God is listening to every conversation you and I have. I think if we remind ourselves of that truth that Jesus is coming, we won't complain as much. Amen? The second instruction is personal integrity. Look at verse 12. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Let me ask you plain. In times of trouble, does your integrity evaporate in the heat of the situation? When it's no longer convenient for you to keep your word, do you abandon your commitments? Successful businesses are built upon a foundation of keeping their word, whether it's convenient or not. And what James is saying here, this is not so much telling us not to make oaths. Time won't permit me to unpack that fully. The point that he really is making here is that for the believer, an oath is superfluous, it's unnecessary. Our truthfulness should be so consistent. Our truthfulness should be so dependable that we don't need any oath to support it. Our word as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ and his children should be as trustworthy as any signed legal document. Oh, help us, Father. Let our yes be yes. Let our no be no. How are you doing in the personal integrity department this morning, beloved? The third instruction, and I had to drift a little bit into verse 13. He says, if any among you are suffering, pray. In times of trouble, beloved, what do we do? We endure. We live like Jesus is coming any second. We speak out for truth, even if it's inconvenient. We speak out, even if it's not popular. We speak out declaring God's word on every situation, not our opinion, not our politics. What does God have to say about it? What do we do? We pray. Now, I came by this morning in the hope that God's word would challenge you, that it would rebuke you, and that it might convict you, but that it also would encourage you. And I want you to be encouraged, beloved, because as believers, we have access to God through prayer. We serve a God who never slumbers and never sleeps. He never puts us on hold. It's never too early, and it's never too late for us to come into his presence. It's never the wrong day of the week, and he's never too busy. He's a God who hears, who listens, and who responds. It was the psalmist who said, early, O oh Lord, in the morning you hear my voice, and you satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Mark recorded that they were rising very early in the morning while it was still dark. Why? To pray. Luke says they spent the whole night doing what? Praying. And it was around midnight when Paul and Silas were praying. Oh, be encouraged this morning, beloved, because any believer can come and approach God at any time from anywhere about anything, and the prayers of the righteous availeth much. 
As his children, God grants us unfettered access into his presence. When times are tough, that's when the tough go to their knees. Patience is granted to us by God. Patience is a gift from God. It is enabled by the Holy Spirit himself. We can be patient as farmers, diligent, strengthening our hearts, and living in anticipation of the coming of the Lord, but this gift is only possible, I believe, through the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to guide and direct, and we certainly need the Holy Spirit to guide and direct our speech and our conduct and our actions and our opinions now. But you can't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit without being saved, and beloved, you can't be saved without Jesus. Programs are not going to solve our problems. That that will transform hearts is what transformed hearts, and that is the power of the gospel. What we need is Jesus. I invite you to pray with me. Perhaps you're sitting there and you're not sure whether or not you're saved. I'm glad you have worshiped with us this morning. All you really need to do now is cry out, as each one of us has at some point in time in our lives. You know that you're a sinner, and you know that you can't save yourself. And perhaps as you're sitting there, you've been harboring feelings of bigotry and racism against some other people blaming them for your lot in life or accusing them of robbing you of what it is that you think that you deserve. And that bitterness is choking your joy. Repent. Repent. The Bible says that if you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Call on his name now. Maybe you're a believer who's worshiping this morning and you haven't been very patient these days. Long lines and waiting and things out of supply. And if Jesus were eavesdropping on every conversation, would you be embarrassed? Why don't you confess that? Maybe you gave your word to somebody and you've used the situation now to back out of that. Clean that up. And beloved, embrace the awesome privilege that we have to come face to face with the God of this universe. A God who sees, a God who hears, a God who listens, a God who responds. Now, Father, take the little that I have and would you multiply it now for your glory. We'll always be quick to give you the praise, to give you the honor, to give you the glory, to give you the credit because you're worthy, Father. Now we pray in the matchless name of Yeshua, Jesus, our Savior and our King. God bless you.